All right, um, welcome back. So uh, this lecture is really about how we measure disease and associations and causality in epidemiology. It's a very important lecture and many of the issues that many of you have been struggling with, like case fatality rate, all of that will get covered here, okay? So this is a, a super important uh, big picture slide. Um, the full handout that goes with it is already in your Google Drive, okay? So take a look at this when you get a chance, please stare at it. I also asked you to do a little bit of reading so that you have some degree of familiarity with this, okay? Broadly, we care about the relationship between exposure and outcomes. So we first measure at what frequency is disease happening in a given population or in a trial, okay? Broadly, these are called measures of disease frequency, also called measures of disease occurrence. Within them, there's two big brackets, incidence measures, prevalence measures, okay? Incidence, prevalence are the two main ways by which we measure disease frequency. And then once you've gathered data on disease frequency or incidence in exposed people, incidence in unexposed people, or incidence in the drug group, incidence in the placebo group, we take those two numbers and we compute what we call measures of association, also called measures of effect. Okay, effect. So broadly, there are two brackets here. We use absolute risk difference measures, okay, or we do a relative ratio. A relative ratio means you divide one by the other, okay? Incidence of mortality in the remdesivir group divided by incidence of mortality in the placebo group. That's a ratio measure or a relative ratio measure. Risk difference or absolute risk difference measures are incidence of mortality in the remdesivir group minus in incidence of mortality in the placebo group, okay? Now you subtract as opposed to divide one by the other. That's about all there is, okay? So this looks intimidating, but it's not when you really look deep. Once you've computed a risk ratio or a risk difference, then you could ask the third uh, issue of interest that if we remove the exposure, how much benefit will we see in that particular population, okay? We call that measures of potential impact. Potential impact of the removal of the bad exposure or the administration of a good exposure could result in some benefit. And there we use measurements like attributable risk, population attributable risk to say what fraction of lung cancer can we eliminate from India if all the smokers stop smoking, right? That is a measure of population level potential impact. All of them will go sequentially and I'll cover all of them in this class. But before I do, I wanna spend a little bit of time laying the background and make sure you understand the critical importance of numerators and denominators, okay? Uh, everything in, in epidemiology is about what is the population of interest that we study, okay? And how we study it. And then we start looking at measurements in that population. So the term that I would be using a lot in epidemiology is this term called cohort, okay? If you've read Asterix, the comics, and you understand uh, the legion, right? Asterix, the legionary. The Roman legion apparently was made up of 10 cohorts, right? And a cohort is a bunch of soldiers, legionaries, who were assigned to the first cohort, sixth cohort, seventh cohort, and they stayed in that cohort. So cohort is a bunch of people who let's say are in a particular club, okay? There is something that is common or shared characteristics among all of them. For example, I could say I'm following up a cohort of healthcare workers. Healthcare workers is the defining feature of that particular cohort. Or I could say I'm following up a cohort of tuberculosis patients, right? Having TB is necessary to be part of that cohort, right? A cohort moves forward in time. You could follow up a cohort to see what disease events happen in that particular cohort, 
So at a simplistic view, let's say you start off with the initial cohort size of 1,000 healthcare workers, and let's say you follow them over one year, okay? 1,000 people at the baseline followed up over one year. At the end of one year, the cohort size has dropped by 11. Now you're left with 989 people, right? So we call this attrition. Attrition means the numbers are becoming smaller and smaller. Every cohort will suffer an attrition, right? Start off a thousand people, you're not gonna continue having the same number as you follow up over time. Why? People could die. People could leave the cohort, right? They might, just, they might move to another country, to another state in the city. Um, they may stop having that characteristics that you care about. A healthcare worker stops being a healthcare worker. So you can't be uh, in that cohort of healthcare workers. Or you could develop the disease event. Right? So follow up means watching to see who is staying in the cohort or not, who develops the outcome that you care about or not. Right? So disease event could be how many among the thousand healthcare workers in Mumbai Corporation end up with COVID-19 over a one year period. That's how we simplistically think about the cohort. So defining the cohort and the membership requirement for the cohort is up to the investigator. This is a very uh, sophisticated, uh, a polished way of understanding what happens in a cohort, right? This is a pretty um, simplistic way, but a more sophisticated way of approaching a cohort would be each person in a cohort, okay, carries forward a certain amount of person time observation with them. If I was a healthcare worker and if you followed me up for one year and I'm still alive at the end of the year and you have information on what happened to me, I have given you one person year of follow-up experience, okay? Now, Lena is a health worker. She's been follow up, followed up. But Lena drops out of the study or disappears and goes to another city after six months. But Lena has still given you six months of person time follow-up in your cohort. So half a year is what she's given you, right? Let's say there is a third healthcare worker who develops COVID after one year. That person has still given you one month of follow-up experience while they were in your cohort and they were eligible to fall sick, right? A beautiful cohort study will be one which can take person time contributed by each individual, let's say 1,000 people, until they die, until they develop the disease, or until we do what is called a censoring. Censoring means when the study is artificially terminated. Every study has to be censored, right? 28 days follow-up in a trial could have been eight months, but they chose to stop the study after 28 days of follow-up, right? At 28, we do something called right censoring. We close the study, we don't know what happens to people after that period. So until censoring, until death, until disease event happens, each person is contributing person time follow-up. If you took all of the person time follow-up and you added it up, you summed it, then you get what is called as the area under that curve. You see that hatched area? That's the hatched area under the curve of a cohort that's moving forward in time. The aggregate of everybody's person time is the most helpful way of looking at a cohort because it allows variable levels of follow-up. It allows for censoring. It allows for the fact that some people will develop the disease and will no longer be eligible to develop the disease again. In this sea of person time, the area, the hatched area, disease events pop up. The beauty of this design is that in that entire aggregate person time experience, if you count the number of COVID events, you get the best estimate of COVID that you will ever get, okay? We call that incidence density or an incidence rate. And you will see how that pans out in a few seconds. But for now, try and understand the importance of person time as a way of thinking about cohort studies, okay? There are basically three mathematical parameters that we estimate all the time in epidemiology, rates, ratios, and proportion. Each of them has a numerator and a denominator. 
it is up to the investigator to clearly define who a numerator is. So you have to define what COVID-19 means for you. You have to then decide what the population is that you care about. Epidemiologists get frustrated as hell when we are only given numerator information. In fact, epidemiologists have been referred to as people who are always searching for the denominator, right? Nothing in epidemiology is just about the numerator. So if somebody came to me and said, oh, Cyan Hospital has eight COVID patients uh, admitted, it means nothing as far as I'm concerned. Eight out of how many? Eight out of 800 people in Cyan Hospital? Well, that's a different number. Eight out of 80 people admitted in Cyan Hospital? That's a different number. The complete significance of that changes once I have the denominator um, in my hand. So connecting the numerator with the correct denominator is half the battle in any epidemiological study, but that requires you to be clear about the numerator and clear about the denominator, okay? Now, a ratio is simply X divided by Y. I don't care what X is, I don't care what Y is. They don't have to be related at all. Any number divided by another number is a ratio, for example, male to female ratio, okay? Sex ratio is a classic ratio where the numerator is not part of the denominator, right? The numerator is not a subset of the denominator. It doesn't have to be. So male to female ratio, doctor to nurse ratio, beds to doctor ratio, beds to population ratio. The bed has nothing to do with the number of human beings in a population, right? They're completely independent numbers, but you can still have a ratio. Okay, so ratio is a very general term with a numerator and there's a denominator. The numerator may be a subset of the denominator. The numerator may not be a subset of the denominator. A proportion is a ratio, except that the numerator must be a part of the denominator. So male to female ratio can never be a proportion, okay? Because the numerator is not a part of the denominator, right? So case fatality is always a proportion. Every time it's a proportion because it's a number of COVID cases out of uh, COVID deaths among all those who developed COVID. So the deaths are a part of the total COVID cases. Therefore, the numerator is a subset of the denominator. And anytime you have a proportion, you can express it as per cent, per hundred, per thousand, per hundred thousand, per million, per 10 million, you can have a multiplier and express it however you want. But tuberculosis, we often describe incidence in terms of 10 per 100,000, right? Because the numbers are, are uh, fairly small at the population level. So it's up to you to describe the proportion in whichever multiplier that you care to use. A risk is a probability that a certain e event will occur in a stated period of time. So. What is my risk at my age with my family history of diabetes, the, with my um, um, BMI, the fact that I'm on metformin, whatever, what's my risk of developing actual diabetes in the next 10 years, okay? It's a clear probability and it is bounded by zero and one. Zero means I have no chance of developing diabetes. One means I have a 100% probability of developing diabetes. Risk is very useful for individual-based prognostication, right? Doc, I have, uh, you know, cancer, uh, you know, stage one cancer, colon, what's my uh, risk of uh, surviving or living for five years? That's the five-year survival risk that oncologists might tell you that in general for someone with your profile, your five-year survival risk or mortality risk is X or Y. Rate is not the same as risk. Now you're talking about something different. Rate is the only variable here where you are, you're talking about the speed at which events are happening, right? Risk might still be the same, but the rate might be different. For example, 50% of all healthcare workers in a hospital might end up with COVID-19 after six months. So the risk is 50%, it's a probability. But everybody doesn't have to get COVID equally over that six month period of time. 
you could have an explosive number at first, which kind of tapers off. So the rate was much higher in the first two months and it's much lower in the next four months, but you may still end up with 50% getting infected. In another hospital, very few get COVID-19 in the first four months. Suddenly in the last two months, everybody gets COVID, right? So the rate can change. Think of rate as an acceleration when you're driving a car, okay? The speed can go up, speed can go down, but on average, you might reach your destination in one hour, but the amount of speed during that one hour can keep fluctuating, okay? So I'm now gonna talk about the two big measures of disease frequency, incidence and prevalence, okay? And I have a very nice graphic to kind of illustrate the difference between the two. Prevalence means at this point in time, what percent of um, Indians uh, have antibodies to COVID-19? Okay. That's a current state. It's cross-sectional. It just tells you how many people have um, prevalence of antibodies in their blood. Okay. Incidence is, think of it as a funnel where the, where the water is coming into a system new cases that are coming into a population. Prevalence is all the accumulated cases in a given population, right? And the, the prevalence can go down when people die and get removed from the prevalent pool or they get cured and they're no longer part of the prevalent pool, right? The formula at the bottom is a nice way to think about the relationship between prevalence and incidence. Prevalence is equal to Incidence multiplied by average duration of the disease. Okay. Incidence is new, new. The word new is fundamental in that definition. New cases means incidence. Already existing old cases is prevalence. Okay. Obviously, as new cases get added and added and added, prevalence keeps going up and up and up. As people die, they get removed, so prevalence can drop or if they get cured, they can again be taken out of the prevalence pool. Okay, so it's a dynamic state and prevalence at any one point is a function of how many new people are being added, how many people are being removed from the pool of infected people or pool of people with disease. Any disease that has a very long duration will always end up with a very high prevalence, okay? For example, once you have diabetes, you have diabetes for life you never get removed from the prevalent pool. Once you're HIV infected, you're HIV infected for life, at least as of now, right? There's no cure. So you will always be part of the HIV prevalence pool, even if your virological load is suppressed, okay? If you have hypertension, you have hypertension for life. You have schizophrenia, you have schizophrenia for life. So you have some diseases where the duration is so lifelong that the prevalence rate will always be high. There are some conditions where you get, you fall sick, you quickly have the disease and you it goes away, then prevalence becomes a, not a very meaningful number. I have never heard of anybody talk about prevalence of dengue fever. I've never heard of anybody say prevalence of malaria. It's meaningless because malaria is three or four days. So the duration is short, short, that we never talk about prevalence. We talk about incidence of malaria, new malaria cases that occur in a population in a country or a region. We never talk about prevalence. On the other hand, everybody will talk about prevalence of diabetes, prevalence of heart disease, prevalence of cancer, prevalence of uh, depression. Some diseases are inherently more suitable to be measured using prevalence. With COVID-19, we can talk about prevalence of COVID-19 antibodies, you talk about new cases of COVID. So we talk about both incidents and we can talk about prevalence. Okay. So the big picture is incidence now is made up of two big types. One is called cumulative incidence, also called incidence risk. The second is called incidence density, also called incidence rate. Okay. Think about this as risk versus rate. Both are incidence measures. One is more superior than the other. Okay. A cumulative incidence or a risk is very simple. Numerator is the number of new cases during follow-up. Denominator is the number of disease-free people at the start of the cohort study. 
okay and they should all be quote unquote at risk they should be eligible to get that disease if not you remove them from the denominator okay let me give you an example case fatality rate due to covid 19 in italy okay so you need to first define the uh, the setting which is italy and basically they define fatality rate as the number of deaths among people who were tested positive for SARS-CoV divided by the number of SARS-CoV cases. So there were 1625 deaths out of 22,512 people with confirmed COVID in Italy. You divide one by the other, you get something called CFR, which is case fatality rate. Unfortunately, although everybody uses rate, this is not a real rate. This is a risk, okay? So this is a classic misnomer. We ask epidemiology students this all the time. It's a simple proportion. It does not tell you the speed at which events are happening. This is not a real rate. It's a proportion and it's a risk, okay? So the correct way of saying it would be case fatality proportion. And the answer here is 7%, right? 7% of people with COVID-19 in Italy died of COVID-19. The numerator is a subset of the denominator. This is a classic case fatality proportion. It gives you a risk. It tells you on average in Italy, 7% of people with COVID-19 will die, okay? And then I've computed something called a 95% confidence interval around that estimate of seven, and it's fairly precise, which is narrow, 6.9 to 7.6. Later on, I'll explain what confidence intervals are, okay? And there is something called infection fatality rate, right? Here, you're not taking the confirmed COVID cases. You're taking the number of people infected as measured by antibodies. You take a population, Santa Clara County, and you say X percent of people are infected. Then you say how many died in that place. You divide one by the other, you get the infection fatality rate. Now the denominator is fundamentally changed. The numerator is still COVID deaths. Now the denominator is not confirmed cases. The denominator is infected people who may not be even be showing symptoms, right? The infected people are way more than the confirmed COVID cases. Therefore the infection fatality rate will be quite low as it is in this particular study that just got published a day or two ago. Okay, so cumulative incidence is great. It's a risk, which is always bounded between zero and one. It requires you to follow up a cohort over a period of time, but it is not great if too many people are gonna drop out, if the population size keeps changing and there is attrition, and then there's something called competing risks. Before they could develop COVID, they died of a car accident, right? All sorts of things can modulate the incidence, therefore, we are forced to resort to a more sophisticated measurement called a rate. Rate captures, like I gave you the car example, the velocity or the average speed. It tells us at what speed new events are happening in a given population. So I'm gonna give you a, an example in a second. So rate is basically the number of disease events that come up in a population divided by the total person time that population has been followed up, okay? So think of it as cases that pop up in a sea of person time, the graphic that I showed you earlier. This is a more sophisticated way of measuring incidence compared to a simple risk. So numerator in an incidence rate, which is also called incidence density, is the number of new events or cases that occur during follow-up in a cohort. Denominator is the total amount of time that cohort has been observed, right? That in turn is made up of individual person time contribution by each human being in the cohort. When you add up everybody's person time follow-up experience, you get that denominator, which is the same hatched area I showed you earlier, okay? This allows different individuals to contribute different levels of follow-up. This is this automatically takes your competing interest, it takes care of censoring, and it also captures in a very sophisticated way the rate at which 
disease events are happening in this particular population. Okay, so this is an important graphic. The numerator is the dots, the black dots, which is the number of disease events that are popping up in a cohort. The denominator is the entire hatched area. The area under that curve is the entire denominator. And that is an aggregate of all person moments or person time, total population time. So a thousand people followed up for one year gives you thousand person years. Okay. 10 people followed up for 10 years gives you 10 times 10, 100 person years of follow up, right? Whichever, you, whatever your time unit is, you can have person weeks of follow up, person days of follow up, person months of follow up, person years of follow up, and you can aggregate them, you get the total person time follow up. So let's go back to the Remdesivir uncontrolled clinical trial that I showed you earlier. 53 people in this trial got Remdesivir. Follow up went on for 28 days after Remdesivir was first begun. So at 28 days, everybody was censored. Okay, censoring means you stop measuring outcomes at that time. It's an artificial number, 28 days. They could have easily followed up for three months, but they chose not to. Okay, so 53 patients start the drug. The clock starts 20 and 28 days is when the clock ends. Okay, in between start and stopping of the clock, you figure out who is alive for how long. Okay, seven patients died. Okay, and you see on this figure, if you stare at it closely, the number of dead people are shown here. And you see here, there are 53 patients, there are 53 lines in this graphic. Each person's trajectory is shown in a graphic. So what I asked Lena to do, was I said, Lena, we know seven people died in this graphic of 53 lines. So the numerator is easy, but I said, Lena, I need the denominator. So how did Lena get the denominator? Well, she saw patient A, patient B, patient three, all the way to 53. And if it went all the way from start to finish, she gave them 28 days for that person. If they died, she took the number of days, they were still being followed up from start to the day of death. If they disappeared or got discharged, then the day they started to the day they got discharged, she computed the number of days. She then summed up all the person days. She got 1,120 person days. So the incidence density of mortality in this cohort of 53 people who got remdesivir is seven deaths per 1120 person days, which works out to six deaths per thousand person days or 0.6 deaths per 100 person days. So this is a very sophisticated measure of incidence. It's an, called an incidence density, also called an incident rate. It tells you if you followed up, say 10 people for 100 years or 100 people for 10 years or uh, 10 days for a thousand person day cohort, you will get six death events in that particular cohort. Okay. That's how you interpret it. You cannot interpret this as a risk. You cannot say 6% or 7% uh, died. That is not the way you interpret this. You actually have to interpret it as six deaths per thousand person days of follow up. All right. And I'll let you look at this risk versus rate slide on your own to understand the difference between the two. Okay. There is also something called risk versus odds. Odds is a term that gamblers use or betting people use, right? What are the odds of India beating Pakistan in the World Cup final, right? You might get an odds of six to one, right? 10 to one, whatever. The odds essentially are a way by which gamblers and casinos and, and bookies uh, compute probability. The way you and I compute probability is a bit simpler. We like risk or probability, right? So, for example, if you have, uh, 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 you throw a dice, okay? What is the probability of getting number one on a, on, a, on a dice? Well, there are six ways the dice could fall. So there are six possible outcomes and you are looking at one. So one in six is the uh, probability of getting whichever number you care about. 
odds would be to say you could get one times one uh, one number versus five is a number of times that you cannot get. So instead of expressing risk as one over six, you express it at one over five. So the denominator in the odds is not the total possible ways something can happen. It's the complement of the numerator. So if the numerator is one, the denominator is five. Okay, I'll give you an example here. There were, there were um, 100 people who started follow up. And by the end of the certain times, time T, you end up with 10 people who fell ill. So the risk is very simple. 10 out of 100 is your incidence. So 10% got the disease, say, after one year. That's a probability that all of us are very comfortable with. But you see, odds are expressed as not 10 over 100, but 10 over 90. So you take this group that got the disease divided by the group that did not get the disease, which is the same as throwing a die. And instead of saying one over six, you say one over five, right? That's why bookkeepers like giving odds as four to six, right? 10 to one chance of losing, right? That's the way they, it's the same number actually. There's nothing new that you need to get. If you got the risk, you can get the odds, okay? But in this situation, can you see, risk is 10%, odds is 10 over 90, which is 11%. By and large, odds and risk are very close to each other if the event rate is rare. But if the event rate is small, then odds and risk divert dramatically. Okay, so keep this in mind because when we talk about odds ratio, this is quite uh, important why we use the term odds. Okay, now we're going to talk about prevalence. Prevalence is of two types, point prevalence and period prevalence. So the numerator is a number of observed cases at time T1. Population is everybody who was in that population at time T1. Prevalence does not talk about new cases. It cannot because prevalence is a one-time study. We go on a certain given day, we measure how many people have hypertension. We are not following them over time. All we get is the number of hypertension patients we found, the number of people we screen. One divided by the other is the prevalence of hypertension, okay? So here is the Santa Clara uh, point prevalence study on COVID-19. On two days, researchers screened 3,000 330 adults and children in California in this county for SARS-CoV antibodies. They found 50 people were positive on either the IgG or IgM antibody, okay? So you take one, you divide by the other, 50 divided by 33330, you get one and a half percent. This one and a half percent is a prevalence estimate. It is not incidence because this cohort in Santa Clara County was not followed up over time. All you do got was on April 3rd and 4th, how many were positive? You don't know when they de developed positivity and you don't know whether the ones who are negative will become positive next month. They could, right? You're not going to ever get true incidence. You only get a slice. That's why it comes from a cross-sectional survey. Cross-sectional means at one slice in time, how many people have the outcome that you care about. So this is a classic point prevalent estimate and the prevalence is as of April 3rd and 4th. It is not the prevalence on June 6th because by which time Santa Clara County prevalence may have dramatically changed. 10% of the population may now be infected. You will not know. Unless you did a follow-up study, you will never get the incidence in Santa Clara County. You only get the prevalence, okay? So prevalence is great for understanding the disease burden in a given population. But it never captures true incidence. It cannot tell you at what rate people are falling ill and you cannot quite get temporal sequencing. You don't know when they got the disease, you don't know which came first, and you really cannot get at causal issues, but they're perfectly fine if all you want is descriptive epidemiology, okay? There is something called period prevalence where now instead of April 3rd and 4th, Let's say the study was done over a six month period, right? Now, obviously some people are at this, there in the population at the start of the six month prevalence study. Some people are still there at the end of six months. 
some people disappear in between some people die some people migrate out so basically you add up anyone who was ever a case during that study six months anyone who was in the denominator during that six month and you can compute what is called as a period prevalence but this is still not a genuine cohort study because everybody is screened only once so you will never know who was negative and then who became positive it just took that much time to screen people and therefore you get the period prevalence so you can say period prevalence of hypertension in india during this calendar year was eight percent right it still doesn't give you incidence but it acknowledged that prevalence was measured over a one-year period it's not easy to do a survey over two days like this santa clara guys guys did it still takes you weeks to do a survey but it still gives you only a prevalence we call it a period prevalence and this graphic shows you at under what situation prevalence goes up what situation prevalence goes down i already told you duration of disease is critical any disease that is lifelong will automatically push up prevalence because once you have the disease you have it for life any disease that can be cured the prevalence can drop if there was a new cure for hiv which completely eliminates hiv hiv prevalence will start going down in the population right so all of this affects the numerator and the denominator and then just to kind of say that when you measure a rate any rate or any risk or any prevalence we sometimes fail to adjust for the population dynamics there right demographers do it all the time you can't do demography without talking about adjusted rates there's a crude rate so the crude rate of uh, a disease in india is this much the age adjusted rate for the disease is something else basically crude rates are not comparable between countries or between location because the underlying age pyramid of the population is different so then how do you adjust for that you adjust for that differing age by taking a standard artificial population applying the age specific rates to that population and then computing something called age adjusted rates so crude rates do not account for age sex or any other variation you could have age and sex adjusted rates or socioeconomic status adjusted rates to then give a more refined comparator otherwise you cannot compare for example you cannot compare uh, the prevalence of malnutrition in say kerala with prevalence of malnutrition in bihar right kerala has older people bihar has younger people kerala has richer people bihar has poorer people you could compare them once you are just say for age and socioeconomic level of development then the comparison makes sense otherwise the crude rates are simply not comparable and then the 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 key issue here to worry about is that whenever you present let's say an incidence a prevalence let's say that santa clara county said prevalence of antibodies in california in that county is one and a half percent that one and a half percent don't forget came from a sample of 3300 people if i had done another sample from santa clara county okay now let's say 200 people were sampled let's say somebody else did a study in santa clara county now they did another sample with 1000 people each of us researchers we may have sampled from the same santa clara county but there is no guarantee at all that we will all get 1.5 percent as the answer why because there is a sample to sample variability any of us who's ever done any sampling will know that sample to sample variability is guaranteed every survey that has ever been done on this world has been a sample survey we never study the entire population. If you studied every human being in Santa Clara, then that 1.5% is the absolute population truth. There's no need to even worry about random error or sampling variability. What you get is the actual truth. N nobody in the world can study every human being in Santa Clara County. Everybody takes multiple samples, some good samples, some bad samples, some large samples, some small samples, all we can get 
is our study estimate, which is why we always use the word estimate. Our estimated prevalence in Santa Clara is 1.5. Your estimated prevalence is 2.5. And you see the only way to handle the fact that we acknowledge that sample to sample variation will happen is to draw what we call 95% confidence intervals around that 1.5%, okay? In statistics, we call it a standard deviation of variance around that 1.5% prevalence. And we report that as the 95% confidence interval. If we did 100 random samples from Santa Clara County, 100 studies, and we drew a nine confidence interval for all 100, okay? On average, 95% of all the confidence intervals that we will generate will capture the true population value of the prevalence of antibodies in that county, okay? 5% of the confidence intervals will miss the true population value. So that is the interpretation of 95% confidence interval. The wider the confidence interval, the less useful that estimate becomes. Let's say if I told you the prevalence of diabetes in India is 30% with a 95% confidence interval that goes from 5% to 60%, 55%. That is such a wide range that you wonder what on earth is this study helpful, right? Because the range is so, so wide that we call it a very imprecise estimate. Imprecise means the confidence interval is too wide. And small studies will always generate very wide confidence intervals and becomes very um, unhelpful. If you look at the Santa Clara uh, example that we gave, they had a fairly narrow confidence interval, right? It was 1.5%, which went from one to 2%. By and large, they got it very nicely and it gives you a sense that their estimate was fairly precise. They could narrow down somewhere close to where the truth could be, okay? That's how we interpret the confidence interval. Larger the study, narrower the 95% CI, okay? Now, now, we don't have much time, so I'm gonna rush on to the last bits and then we'll close, okay? Measures of effect and measures of potential impact. So we've spent a lot of time measuring disease occurrence, incidence, prevalence, incidence rate, incidence risk. Once we have them, what do we do? We can either, like I said, divide one by the other and compute something called ratio measures, or you can subtract one incidence from another to get something called difference measures or risk difference measures. So let me give you an example of both. And I've kind of shown you the same handout to explain the difference measures, and then there are ratio measures. You divide one incidence by another in one, and you subtract one incidence by another in another. Both are useful, and both are used quite commonly in how we report studies, okay? Now, to understand how we think about uh, these measures, this is how we construct the famous epidemiological two-by-two two table, okay? On the y-axis, we have exposed versus not exposed or treatment as a pass to control. And then at the top, we say disease, didn't develop the disease or case against controls, okay? These are the four cell values, A, B, C, D, okay? And when you look at the cell values, you say among all those who were treated, A developed the disease, B didn't. Total number of treated people is A plus B. Among all the ones who are unexposed or placebo, C developed the disease, D didn't. Total number of people who are in the placebo group is C plus D. Total number of cases who ended up disease is A plus C. Total number of people who didn't develop the disease is B plus D. So you have two row totals. So these are rows, okay, horizontal. You have two columns, vertical. So you have two row totals, you have two column totals. One of the nicest things about a two by two table is that they must all add up, okay? If they don't add up, then you know something is wrong with your numbers, right? So if you got A and if you have the total, you already got C. If you have C and you have the row total, you automatically got D. 
right, by subtraction. So once you have the incidents and you put them in the two by two table, all the other numbers automatically fall in place so long as you know the denominators, right? So these row totals, they are column totals. This is called a two by two contingency table, okay? And you can easily compute the measurements that we're talking about. In a cohort study or a randomized control trial, the relative risk is incidence of disease in the treatment group divided by incidence in the control group, okay? Or in a case control study, you can do the odds of being exposed if you are a disease divided by odds of being uh, exposed if you're a non-disease. You do A times D divided by B times C. A, D over B, C gives you something called an odds ratio, okay? Let me now work out one for you. So here is a hydroxychloroquine um, trial. 75 patients randomized to the chloroquine arm. 75 patients randomized to the control arm or standard of care arm, okay? So what's this example? The two by two table becomes clearer for you, okay? So 75 people, see here, this, 75 people, 75 people have hydroxychloroquine. That is the row total at the top, of whom 53 became negative for COVID. So the incidence of a good outcome or a positive outcome is 53 out of 75 if you have hydroxychloroquine. Okay, that's the first incidence. If you are 75 people who are in the standard of care treatment or the control arm, 56 became negative with hydroxychloroquine. So 56 out of 75. So these are the two incidences. 70% of the hydroxychloroquine group got better. 74% in the control group got better. You divide one by the other, you get a risk ratio of 0.94, which is almost like you're dividing the same number by itself. 70 and 74 are not far apart. So you're getting a value close to one, okay? A risk ratio of one means it's called a null effect. Null means a negative finding. Null means there is really no difference between the treatment group and the placebo group. They both have the same rate of developing whatever outcome you're looking for. So in this study, a 0.94 risk ratio means hydroxychloroquine did not protect against a bad outcome. Hydroxychloroquine did not work in this trial. It was a null finding, okay? Because the risk ratio is close to one. You could take the same incidence measures, 70 and 74. Instead of dividing one by the other to get 0.94, you could just subtract one from another. So 70 minus 74 is minus 4%. So all hydroxychloroquine did was lower the risk of a bad outcome by just 4%, which is very tiny. You could also compute an odds ratio that gives you an odds ratio of 0.81, which is a little better than 0.94. That's the difference between risk and odds that I already explained earlier. But this is how we take a two by two table and we compute these measures of effect. So risk ratio and risk difference are both measures of effect, measures of association. The larger the risk ratio, right? A risk ratio of tobacco and lung cancer is in the order of 10. The greater, the stronger the relation between smoking and um, um, lung cancer. Here, if chloroquine worked, you want to see a protective effect. You want to see chloroquine reduce the risk of disease by a certain time. So we look for a protective risk ratio, say of 0.5, which means a 50% lower risk in the chloroquine group for death compared to the placebo group, okay? And then lastly, we take this and compute something called measures of potential impact, okay? And for that, I'm gonna give you a very important concept. In every population, certain number of people will develop the disease even with no exposure, okay? So even if nobody smoked, you could still get lung cancer, right? 
because not every lung cancer is because of smoking. So with or without smoking, in any given population, you will have some people developing lung cancer, for example. So in this, the incidence in the non-smoker group, right, is what we call the baseline incidence. No smoking at all, you still have some number, level of disease for that particular population, right? So that's called the baseline risk. Then you say, if then people smoked, what is the additional amount of incidence that smoking brings to the table? Then you take the baseline risk, you remove it among the incidents in the smokers, then what you have left is this chunk. See, this part you cannot ascribe to smoking because even non-smokers would have developed that level of disease, right? So you take the total bar incidence in the smokers and you remove the bar, which is the incidence in the non-smoker, right? So this particular baseline risk must be subtracted. Then what you have left is just this part. This part now is truly attributable to smoking, right? This is called the notion of excess risk, excess above the baseline. Another way to think about it is what fraction of lung cancer among smokers can you attribute to the smoking behavior? Well, only this chunk. Because even if the smokers had not smoked, they would have still developed lung cancer at a certain rate. That cannot be due to lung cancer, so you remove it. So for example, 80% of lung cancer deaths are attributable to smoking, which means there is still a 20% that is not because of smoking, could be because of asbestos, could be because of air pollution, could be because of something else, okay? This is called attributable risk and population attributable risk. Now in COVID-19, this has become super important, right? People are saying there is a certain number of deaths that we will find in Mumbai city, we will find in all of India, we will find in all of New York, right? Based on last year's data for New York, all cause mortality, you have established a baseline level of risk, number of deaths. Then you say during this COVID, how much excess mortality did we see, right? So the red part of the graph is all the excess mortality that people are now attributing attributing to COVID or COVID related disruptions to healthcare, right? A stroke patient is not being able to see anymore, a doctor, so they may die. Well, earlier they would have been treated. So excess mortality is starting to become a very important variable, which captures how damaging COVID is because compared to the expected risk of mortality in a given city, how much are we now seeing that is jumping up over the baseline expectation. So excess mortality or excess risk is always, don't attribute all deaths in Mumbai to COVID, right? Because certain number of people would have died because of road traffic accidents and many other things in Mumbai anyway. But the additionality is what you're trying to capture in this particular analysis, right? So excess deaths is equal to observed number of deaths minus expected number of deaths under normal conditions, right? Based on historic average, you can know what is the number of deaths we expect to see in Mumbai during the month of April every year. And instead of 80,000 deaths in April, we saw 180,000 deaths in April, right? That difference is what you're computing as excess deaths. So during the month of April, Mumbai saw 100,000 excess deaths and whether that's directly attributable to COVID or whether it's COVID related disruptions due to lockdown, that's the kind of work you need to do to tease it out, okay? But it's helpful. A lot of people are talking about excess deaths, right? So in a clinical trial, we could compute the same sorts of measures using this. For example, incidence in the standard of care group was 74%, same trial, hydroxychloroquine, okay? Exact same data. Incidence in the control arm is 74%. Incidence in the chloroquine arm is 70%. You subtract one from the other, you get what we call risk difference. 
in a in a clinical trial they call it an absolute risk reduction okay four percent reduction in the risk and then you could compute a risk ratio which you already did before it was 0 0.94 and then you can compare a relative risk reduction right so that four percent is the absolute reduction between the difference between 74 percent and 70 percent is four percent right that's the absolute risk reduction I can express that 4% on its own, or I can express that 4% as a function of that 74%. If I take that 74% and say, what fraction of that 74% is that 4%, I'm basically standardizing it to the baseline incidence that I would have seen with no drug in that group. So 4% divided by 74%, gives me a 5% relative risk reduction. So it's a tiny relative risk reduction I'm seeing in this particular trial, okay? And then the last number you could get in a clinical trial is something called number needed to treat. So you take one and you divide it by the absolute risk reduction of 4%. So one divided by 0 0.04, 4% gives me 25. What does that 25 mean? I need to treat 25 people with hydroxychloroquine to prevent one bad outcome. That's called number needed to treat. Number who need to receive the experimental drug in order to avert one bad outcome. So larger the number needed to treat, less and less useful that therapy is. If I have to treat 1,000 people with remdesivir, each one costing me hundreds of dollars to avert one COVID mortality. Is it really worth my effort? Versus if the number needed to treat was five, five people need to be treated with remdesivir to prevent one COVID death. That's a completely different interpretation. So basically you can see that all these numbers are computed with the same two by two table that you saw before. That's the beauty of this. They are all measurements that you throw out from the same two by two table from the same two incidence numbers. 70% in one group, 74% in the other group. You first do a subtraction. That's the absolute risk reduction. You take that absolute risk reduction and express it as a proportion of what you would have seen in the control group. That's a relative risk reduction. You take one divided by the absolute risk reduction. You get this number called number needed to treat which tells you how many hundreds, tens of people need to be treated with the experimental drug to prevent one bad outcome, okay? So in any given clinical trial that you read, you will see all these numbers. So I'd like you to please put in some work on your own. Please use my slides, okay? Go back to this remdesivir trial that I showed you, okay? Take this numbers and make sure you can replicate all the numbers that I've given you and that you can get exactly at this summary table on how this trial result works out, okay? I think that exercise will give you some confidence that you can work with a two by, two by two table. Trust me, this is not easy. I mean, we take weeks in an epidemiology course to make our students comfortable with two by two tables. Lena would have spent weeks in her epi 101 course learning all this, and I'm scrunching it to you in a one hour lecture. And the last two things on how you interpret confidence intervals, for these measurements. So it's not enough to just say risk ratio is 0 0.9. I again have to throw 95% confidence intervals around the 0.94, right? I don't just say risk difference is 4%. Again, I have to say this is a sample study. And if I repeated it, I may not get the same answer. I have to capture that uncertainty and I'm gonna give you a range, right? So the risk difference might be two to 6% or one to, uh, uh, 9%, so on and so forth. So how do I interpret that? If it's a risk ratio, then the null value is one. Can you see here? So here is a meta-analysis. You will get a whole lecture on meta-analysis next week. But for now, here is the studies uh, on uh, tobacco smoking and TB mortality, okay? So you can see the null, the, the line here, where the relative risk is one. One means there is no association between smokers and non-smokers in terms of their risk of getting, dying of TB. The risk of dying of TB in smokers is the same 
as the risk of dying in non-smoker. How will you get a risk ratio of one when you divide one incidence by the same incidence, right? That's why the null value for a risk ratio measure is one. Any confidence interval that crosses one is not a statistically significant outcome. In other words, this study, for example, okay, where the point estimate is already close to one and the 95% CI crosses one. It goes from here all the way to two, which means there is no statistically significant association between tobacco smoking and mortality in this particular study. Okay, what about this study? Now this study has the risk ratio of somewhere around 1.7 or 1.8, but the lower bound of the 95% CI does not touch or cross one, which means it is a statistically significant association which shows that tobacco smoking increases the risk of uh, tuberculosis mortality, okay? But if this 95% CI were wide enough to cross one, then it crosses the null value. Now you can no longer declare that there is a significant association between uh, smoking and TB, okay? When we talk about meta-analysis, I will dive deeper into how you interpret these, okay? What about a risk difference measure? For a risk difference measure, you cannot use a null value of one. Why? For a risk difference, you're subtracting one incidence from another. Under what situation will you get a null value? A null value in a risk difference is 0%. Incidence in the hydroxychloroquine group is 70. Incidence in the placebo group is also 70. 70 minus 70 gives you zero. So zero is the correct null value or a negative result when you're working with risk difference measures. When you're working with risk ratio measures, one is the null value because you're dividing the same number by itself to get one. So now you see, when you work with risk differences, the null line is centered around zero, right? Now you're seeing, is the confidence interval touching zero or not to decide on whether this particular effect is statistically significantly associated or not. So for risk ratio measures, you always look to see whether the 95% CI touches or crosses the null value of one. If it's entirely on lower than one, doesn't touch one, fine, it's a protective measure. If it's entirely on the higher side of one, doesn't cross one, it's significantly a uh, risk or a harmful measure, right? But in a risk ratio, it should not, it should be entirely on this side of zero or entirely on that side of zero. Both are acceptable. But if the 95% CI touches or crosses zero, then it's a non-significant association for a risk difference measure. Whew, that was a lot of ground we covered. 